Psalm 18. We're only going to be looking really as a devotional thought from verse 46 and drawing a couple things here and there. But I do want to uh, draw our attention to some of the context of the psalm. And so for the sake of context, I am going to read um, the entirety of the psalm. But like I said, this will be more of a devotional thought. So yes, it's a longer psalm, but I would like to read it and then just focus our attention on verse 46. So Psalm chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, this is a psalm of David. And the inscription says that the, this is the psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The pangs of death surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry came before him even to his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with darkness under his feet, and he rode upon a cherub and flew. He flew upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him, his thick clouds passed with hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered the foe, lightnings in abundance, and he vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me out into a broad place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. And with the devious, you will show yourself shrewd. For you will save the humble people, but will bring down haughty looks. For you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by you, I can run against a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. As for God... His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of deer. He sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to make war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness 
has made me great. You enlarge my path under me so my feet did not slip. I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn back again till they were destroyed. I have wounded them so that they could not rise. They have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also given me the necks of my enemies so that I destroyed those who hated me. They cried out, but there was none to save, even to the Lord. But he did not answer them. Then I beat them as fine as the dust before the wind. I cast them out like dirt in the streets. You have delivered me from the strivings of the people. You have made me the head of the nations. A people I have not known shall serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they obey me. The foreigners submit to me. The foreigners fade away and come frightened from their hideouts. The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is he who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me. He delivers me from my enemies. You also lift me up from those who rise against me. You have delivered me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. Great deliverance he gives to his king and shows mercy to his anointed, to David and his descendants forevermore. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the assurance that you are our rock and our deliverer, and that most importantly, we see this reality of who you are in Christ, who is our sure and steady anchor. I pray that you would encourage our hearts as we consider just this little thought from your word, from this precious book that we hold dear. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I would dare say in any of the classes I've taken at a seminary or at Maranatha Bible College, I think the hardest class was probably the hermeneutics class, which may seem odd. Hermeneutics is basically the class that teaches you how to interpret the Bible. You may say, why was that your hardest class? I think it's because I, I didn't know how to read the Bible. And that's, again, that sounds really weird, but because I grew, I grew up going to church, I heard my pastor preach, I heard my parents teach me from the Word, I had my youth leaders who were teaching me from the Word, but I didn't have somebody sitting down and trying to open up the Bible and then say, okay, now think through what does this mean, and, and dig deeply and try to understand what is the point of what this verse is saying, or this text is saying, or whatever the case may be. Over the course, though, of my hermeneutics classes, I was learning all of these these things that were going to help me, give, giving tools to me they were, they were doing that would help me understand the Bible. One of the things that I still wrestle with, though, is anytime I get to Psalms, where it starts to say things that I'm like, I don't know how, I don't know what to do with that. And it's any of the Psalms where the psalmist, like David, is praying what's called imprecatory prayers. Imprecatory meaning that he's calling on God to bring judgment and death to his enemies. Because I'm so used to reading in the New Testament the teachings of Jesus, where Jesus tells his disciples and his followers, the person who slapped you, turn the other cheek. You have heard that it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I'm telling you, bless those who persecute you and do good to those who spitefully use you. And you read those teachings of Jesus, and then you turn to verses like in Psalm 18, where David is not seeming, in my opinion, to be doing that. He's not turning the other cheek, as it were. But he is, I believe, modeling for us what what it means to express ourselves to God openly and honestly. I would dare say, most of us, if we were asked, for example, to pray in public, would not be so open and honest as to pray prayers that we think inside our head and know God hears. I would dare say most of our prayers would be more along the spiritual lines where we're not going to be saying the things that uh, might sound a little uncouth and odd to anybody else to hear. 
But here's David. He's a musician, and he's praying prayers by writing music. And here, he is expressing to God his gratitude that God delivered him from his enemies. For us, our enemies are not necessarily in the same vein as for David. We don't literally have a Saul hunting us down trying to kill us. So often we have to spiritualize our enemies when we read the Psalms. We say, Lord, deliver me from the world system where they're trying to bombard my faith with things that they think will turn me away from you and from what I know to be true in your word. Or, Lord, deliver me from Satan, from the evil one who wishes to undermine my faith and draw me away from the truth that I know. Nevertheless, for David, his prayer of deliverance from his enemies was a very real thing. Thank you for delivering me from Saul, who had his men literally aiming bows and arrows at me, trying to take my life. Thank you for delivering me. But then he starts to say things like, God, I, I, I want you to recompense these people. I want, I want you to give me the strength to be able to overcome them and destroy them and and he goes on and on. And we could go through the whole psalm and try to explain all of those things. But I want to focus on something that might help. At least it helps me when I think of psalms that are imprecatory like this. That helps maybe tone our minds and our, our thoughts when we think, how do I pray this psalm or how do I sing this psalm or how do I understand this psalm? By looking at specifically verse 46. Because verse 46 is precious to me for several reasons. One, because I think it is one of those verses that the New Testament uh, authors were thinking of when they were talking about Jesus Christ, as we'll see in a moment. But number two, as a young child, my grandma and grandpa pastored, my grandpa pastored a small congregational church called Ashwa Chapel, and they would sing songs that my church, I went to First Baptist Church of Hibbing, Minnesota, they would sing songs in their church that were very different from what I was used to. I was used to more of the songs like we sang tonight, um, out of the Majesty Hymnal, things like that. But they were singing completely different songs that I wasn't familiar with. And oftentimes, they were singing psalms that were adaptations of the psalms. And one of the songs I distinctly remember hearing my grandparents and their church singing together as my grandpa had his guitar up there, and they were, he was playing and they were singing the song, was this verse. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I can still hear my grandma and grandpa singing that song from that verse. And I want to draw our attention to this verse because I think this, in a sense, is what David is really anchoring his mind on as he thinks about the trials he's endured, as he thinks about the deliverance he has experienced, and as he thinks about all of that in light of who God is. So I want to share with you this evening four thoughts that we can kind of wrap our minds around as we look to this portion of Scripture. And these are all truth statements about who our God is and how we understand who he is. So number one, I want us to see that God is the true and living God. Verse 46 simply begins in our English text with three words. The Lord lives. And you'll notice in your text that the Lord is in all caps, which means this is, in the Hebrew language, the covenant name of God that's being used. Yahweh, or sometimes we, we say Jehovah. Jehovah lives. And what's interesting about that word lives is in the Hebrew, it's not actually a verb. It's an adjective. It's describing who God is. It's not saying God is living. He's saying as the Lord lives. He is the living Lord. He is the true and living God. So I want you to point you here to several things. There's one point where he talks about how they were, his enemies were crying out. So jump back up to verse 41. When he's talking about his enemies who had at one point been pursuing him and attacking him and now they're being overcome by him, he says in verse 41, they cried out, but there was none to save. Even to the Lord, Yahweh, but he did not answer them. He's basically saying, here were my enemies who were pagans. 
and completely wishy-washy in their view of who, God, of who a God is, let alone the one true God. At the beginning of verse 41, it says, they cried out, but no one heard them. In other words, they were crying out to their gods. They were crying out to Baal and to Dagon and any other of the pagan gods of antiquity that you can think of. They were crying out to them, but nobody heard them. And in desperation, they start saying, okay, Yahweh, if you're the God, then why don't you help us? But Yahweh wasn't listening to them either. Yahweh was helping his servant David. So even though they were crying out to whatever God they wanted to cry out to, they hoped would deliver them, David says they didn't understand the, the true and living God like I do. And in verse 46 he says, the true and living God is the one who is alive. He isn't a God who lives. He's not like the pagan gods. He's not like Baal. He's not like Dagon. They're completely made up. They're they're hunks of wood. They're hunks of metal, hunks of stone. They're nothing. But Yahweh, he is the true and living God. And I know that he is there as the one true and living God to whom I can offer my worship. So God is the true and living God, number one. Number two, God is the sure foundation of his people. The very next phrase he says in verse 46 is, Blessed be my rock. For David, as a warrior, this was probably very important to him. Anybody who's been in military, and I'm saying this not as somebody who's ever been in the military. My brother has served. I have never served, so I'm speaking completely out of, uh, as an amateur, not by experience whatsoever, but If you are in the military and you're leading people into battle, you know that one of the important things is that the terrain that you're on be advantageous for you and not for your opponent, not for your enemy. For him, he wanted to be on a sure foundation, on a foundation that was unshakable, but that was also a higher ground than his enemy. And when he says, my God is living, he then turns and says, and he is the living foundation that is sure for me the rock, the foundation that's unmovable. It won't ever change. And I want to draw our attention to two things for us about the rock of Christ. If you turn with me to Acts chapter 4, this is a sermon that's happening as the church is kind of a fledgling church, growing, the Spirit is working. And in Acts chapter 4, they are being commanded by people not to preach. So Peter and John are preaching the gospel and they're not, they're not being heard. People are being, are being angry at the fact that they're talking about this. Jesus is the Messiah. In fact, Peter and John are getting arrested. And so in verse 5 it says, it came to pass, in Acts 4, verse 5, it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were with the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, talking about Peter and John here, it says, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well? Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This, now referring again back to Jesus Christ, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. For David, the rock that God delivered him was in his providence, him protecting him, caring for him, leading him along as he was running for his life from Saul. But David was looking for a greater deliverance ultimately. Yeah, I'm sure he didn't want to get a spear thrust inside him from Saul's men. But David was looking forward to the day when one of his sons, the Messiah, would be the ultimate rock and foundation to deliver not just David's descendants, 
but to deliver all who would place their faith in him. And someone like Peter was completely unmoved by the challenges he saw. He saw his opponents, he saw the Sanhedrin, all these religious leaders who are saying, who are you to tell people that they need to follow this Jesus? What name is your authority to deliver this man, to make this man, heal this man, care for these people, preach this message? Who is your authority? And Peter, without reserve, without any fear, because this man was just boldless, or bold, just bold, he was fearless, he points to them and he says, I'm telling you, it's by the same Jesus you crucified, the same Jesus who rose from the dead, the same Jesus that the Old Testament says is the chief cornerstone that was rejected, and it's the same Jesus that there's no other way to God. That is the man who is my sure foundation. That is the man who I am proclaiming. And it is in his name that I heal people. For us, for Peter, for your parents or whoever led you to Christ, the sure foundation was Christ. And so in the gospel, our sure foundation ultimately is Jesus. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the only way. But it's not just in the gospel that God is our sure foundation. It's also just in the challenges of life. And I want to turn you just to one thought from 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter now, who just we just read, is basically saying, Jesus is the sure foundation. He is the one whom I am preaching and proclaiming right now. He writes another letter. And here's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 5. When he talks about the Christian life, he says in verse 8 of 1 Peter 5, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's not just in the gospel that God is our sure foundation as his people, but it's even in our sanctification, in our growth as a Christian. You will endure things in your life that are hard and painful. Many of you already have. You've endured things that I couldn't even imagine. But if your anchor at your salvation was Christ, how much more does your anchor need to continually be Christ as you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. It's the same Jesus who is perfecting you. And he says to these people who are suffering that he's writing to, it's after you suffered for a little while, but guess what God's doing when he does it? He's perfecting you. So in the same way Jesus is your rock and your salvation at, at your faith when you come to him, continue to stand on the rock of Christ as you walk this Christian life. So God is the true and living God, David says. God is the sure foundation of his people. Number three, God is the deliverer. Psalm 18, again, back in verse 46, he says, The Lord lives, Yahweh lives, blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation, the God who is my salvation, be exalted. He describes God as the one who's the deliverer. David saw Saul's men chasing him, and he began to run. And he could have thought, boy, it was my intelligence, it was my skill and cunning that I outwitted every single one of my enemies who were pursuing me, so that as he hid behind this rock and he watched Saul's men passing by him, not seeing him, not getting him, he could have said, wow, I am all that in a bag of chips. I am fantastic. I just completely outwitted all of Saul's army. He could have said that. But he didn't. Just as he stood before Goliath and said, you have defied the armies of the living God. You come to me with sword and shield and spear. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. Everything for David's life was all about, consumed with knowing and acknowledging God. So as he watched Saul's men searching for him, 
but not finding him. David didn't sit there and think, wow, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. He sat there and said, God, you are my deliverer. In the same way for us, as we look to our sin, as we look to our helplessness as, as people, we can't save ourselves, and we come to faith in Christ, we cannot say, it was by my cunning. I, I looked at the gospel, all of it made sense. I looked at the evidence, it seemed to make sense, and boom, now I'm a Christian. It was also the deliverance of God that saved us at salvation. And continually, as you grow as a Christian, as you help other people, some of, some of us in this room are interacting with teens and helping them grow in their faith. It's not you influencing them. It's God influencing them through you. God is still the deliverer in everything. So God is the true and living God. He is the sure foundation of his people. He is the deliverer. And number four, and finally, if all of that is true, and it is, then number four, God is worthy of exaltation. Let the God of my salvation be exalted, be lifted high, be magnified in the eyes of all people. If, this, if all of these are true for you, if God is your true and living God, if God is the sure foundation for you, if God is your deliverer, then how could you not exalt him, lift him high, make much of who he is? Why is my life too often about Rodney? Why is my life all too focused on my own comfort and the things that I want and the things that I desire in life? Why is my life not consumed with this overwhelming desire and passion to exalt the Lord, to exalt God, to exalt Christ? It's often because I don't acknowledge those previous three things. I have other things that become my living God to me sometimes. I have other things that I claim as my sure foundation. I have other things that I seek to deliver me from things that are hard in life. But the reality is, is none of those things ultimately are those realities. The reality is God is alone the true living God. God is the sure foundation for me. God is my deliverer. Therefore, God is the one who should be exalted in my life. So I ask you this question as we close then. Is that who God is for you? David goes through this entire psalm. It's 50 verses, and he's talking at points in ways that are uncomfortable for us. Because we're like, I don't know that I should be praying that about my enemies. But David was basically pouring out his heart. He was saying, here are people who are literally trying to kill me. But you know what? I'm ultimately know, I ultimately know that God is the one true God. He is my foundation. He is my deliverer. And therefore, I'm going to magnify and lift him up. And yeah, life is hard. Yeah, there's bad things that are happening. But you know what? God is my all-consuming passion. And so he is the one that I will proclaim in my song. Is that true for you? Is God the true and living God to you? If you're in this room and you're not saved, he's not the true and living God to you. He is the living God, but he's the one that if you continue to resist, one day it'll be a fearful thing to fall into his hands. So my first appeal is if anybody in this room is not a Christian, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a kid, whether you're an adult, whether you're old or young, it doesn't matter. Is Jesus Christ the true and living God to you, is he the one that you confess with your mouth that is, he is Lord and believe in your heart God raised from the dead? If so, then God will be your sure foundation. God will be your deliverer and your whole life will no longer be about magnifying you and lifting up you. It'll be all about exalting Christ. For those of us who are Christians, is that our passion? Do people know you as the one who is a servant of the true and living God? Are you somebody that people look to and say, that person's sure foundation is not in their, in their working for the weekend and trying to go get drunk, not in trying to self-gratify themselves, not in trying to entertain themselves. Their sure foundation is none of that. Their sure foundation is in their God. They believe their God is their deliverer. And I see it because I see them lifting him up. Is that true of you? It was true of David, and I hope it's true of his descendants 
forevermore. Let's pray. You are the true and living God, Lord. There is none besides you. There is no God like you. May you be God and may we be your people. Thank you for giving to us a model like David who honestly confessed his heart before you but also anchored his heart and his mind on truth. Help us, Lord, to do the same. Help us to pour out our hearts before you. Help us to be honest and know that even in the times that are difficult, we acknowledge that you are indeed our treasure, our passion, our foundation, our deliverer. I pray, Lord, for the person in this room who may not be saved, whether they are actively rebelling or whether they don't realize it. I pray, Lord, you'd bring them to this knowledge that you are the true and living God, a gentle God, a kind God, and that there is hope in you. I pray for those of us who are your children that you would help us to cling to these truths each day and that our lives, our bodies, our minds, our words, everything would be vessels simply used to exalt and magnify you. And it's in Christ's name we pray this. Amen.